Session days would be, you know, you got 15 kids, they keep on getting suspended. And so however many days all together, the entire school have for suspension. You can have suspension events, which five kids get into a fight. That's one event, five suspensions. Or you can do student suspension incidents, where that one fight with five kids counts as five. There are reasons for doing each one. There's also, some, you can separate them out in school versus out of school. And um, just read a very interesting study where school just completely decreased their number of suspensions. They stopped doing in school suspension. So that just cut it out. So if it makes a difference, deal with them individually. If it doesn't make a difference, then they can just lump them all together. But the bottom line to all those is no matter how you do those, what's missing is some measure of the size of the school. And so when you ask whoever's got your discipline information, they're not going to give you the size of the school. And the reason they won't, that's not on their computer. Because the person who tracks it really tracks suspensions, office referrals, they don't track membership in the school. And the reason you need that is you need that so that you can do, for instance, 1% didn't get suspended and 1% did get suspended. Or how many days kids are suspended versus how many days kids are not suspended. And so sometimes you need to get the data from two different places. The good news is average daily membership is easy to pull down off the web, so you don't even need to ask permission for it. Um, so you think, how uh, what is it going to be used for? And the good thing is you did a lot of this last semester with me. Um, once again, what will you compare it against? So we're used to getting reports. You had 14 suspensions in your school. And my answer to it, in time. <laughs> It's, so you've got 14 suspensions in your school. What should that be? Or what was it before you implemented this thing? Or what is it in a typical school in the district? Will it matter which day the child is out, or is it just important he was out? Yeah, this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, one of my friends came to me years ago and said, I've got a personal problem. I'm like, <laughs> and and first the problem was her whenever her ex had custody of the kid, the kid was tardy. And so now they were going back and forth as as we all knew we have kids and we were split. And so she wanted to show you know that the kid was tardy when the kid was with death. Going down. The bad news was, it was now a new school year, because this is in September. At the end of the school year, absences and tardies and all those things get compressed down. You can no longer just go and look and see which days the kid was out or which days the kid was tardy. It disappears. Now the downside to that is, if you want to look for patterns like kids aren't there on Mondays and Fridays, you can't find that for previous years, but you can for the current year. Hopefully none of you are going to be in the situation where, where you're going to be working on this project and trying to get data past June 30th. Because all of you are planning, you have all your data collected, and if you're not done in July, you're just going to be right, not collecting. Okay. But keep those sorts of things in mind, that there's a lot of information that just disappears, you can't go back and recreate. Um, here's another one that messes everybody up. Is how the child did on the test and the attendance, or are they separate? And the reason I say it that way is, 
one of the first students that I had to uh, get a backhoe to dig up. And you know, that means their, their studies buried. So I had to dig them out. They sent out a survey, and they were going to match how principals felt on the survey to how the school was doing. There's just one problem. Surveys are anonymous. Now, that, that is worst case scenario. Um, but, you end up with the same problem and it's more recoverable if it's, you need to know the kid's attendance and you need to know the kid's test score. Because then you go back to your data shop and say, oh, I need the match. They'll be happier if you tell them up front. Because sometimes you need a match, sometimes you don't. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Sorry. So, sometimes it just matters the attendance for a treatment group versus the attendance for a control group. Other times, what you want to look at is, how, is the relationship between attendance and test scores in the treatment group versus the relationship in in the control room. If that's the case, when you ask for the data, make sure the folks you're asking for the data from know to give it to you because they don't want to give you the kid's name. I'll tell you that one up front. Which is fine. You don't need the kid's name. What you just need is a row that has the kid's test score and his attendance as opposed to one sheet with test scores and one sheet with attendance. But before you make the request, think that one through. And then are the students matched? Are you just matching by the classroom or by the school? Or do you really need to know that Issa and Felicia are sitting on the front row? And that's going to make a big impact on what you ask your data people for. And they will be much happier with you if you only ask them for it once. And don't make them do it twice because you forgot to tell them, oh, I need attendance aligned with the test score. Okay. We're going to <coughs> skip over most of this, I think. Um, we talked about how to structure it. One thing we haven't done is how to code into categories. Um, I'm going to use the data spreadsheet to give you an example of how to do this. Okay. Y'all remember this one? <laughs> Far too well, right? Okay. Um, This could be pass, fail, whatever you want to call it. So what do you think a good dice roll is? <coughs> Seven. Seven or above? Okay. Let me introduce you to a function in Excel that will help you do that. So what I did is I clicked in the same column. I label a row so that way I'll remember what I did. And then I'm coming back to my friend, Mr. Autosum. So I got into function, into more functions. And when you first get your data, especially if it's from survey, if you pull it down and I go like Survey Monkey, um, you know, it'll give you this nice Excel spreadsheet and it's got, I can never remember if it comes down as numbers or more letters, but it will tell you each response to question one. One responded per row, just like we do test data. But if you're trying to break that down into categories, you're looking at it and you say, yeah, I got 300 respondents, and I got count how many nevers are in there. I'll tell you the truth, if I had to do it, I'd mess it up. Because I don't count that well. Yes, I know, I don't do math very good. I don't like numbers. Um, but Excel will do it for you. And the tool that does it for you in Excel is called Count It. <coughs> 
C-O-U-N-T-I-F. And so I put that in the search box. I click, I click go. And I've got, I'm using Excel 2013, so it comes back with four options. If you're using 10, it might come back with three options or something like that. Each of these does something different. The one we really want is just plain count. Yeah. So I click OK on it. It's really only asking me two questions. It's asking me range, so where is the data, and criteria. So I'll do the range first, because that's the real easy one. Basically, it's where I have my dice rolls. So on my spreadsheet, it's B2 colon B36. Now, the criteria is the fun part. This will accept letters, words, numbers, or logical expressions. So, if you want to count how many boys versus girls, it was coded as M and F. I would type an F in criteria, and it would count up how many of those cells have an F. If I wanted to count up how many of those cells have a 6, I'd type 6 in criteria, it would count them up. Individual 6 or anything, there's a large number on the 6 right. so you count the individual 6. Individual 6. <laughs> um, if, if the data came down as always and never, I would type always, and it would count how many cells have the word always just the word always in. Since we said that a roll of seven or more is a good roll, I could do one of these and count the twelves, do another one to count the elevens, do another one to count the tens, then add them all together. Or a roll of seven is greater than six, right? So So shift period is actually the greater than symbol. And so I typed in greater than six. Now the cool thing is Excel understands that. So if I type in greater than six, Excel will count how many cells have a number greater than six in them. And of course my spreadsheet is going to be a little different than yours because this is what I rolled last time. But it's telling me that I have 22 rolls that were greater than 6, which is 7 or more. Now, do the other thing to do the bad rolls, the 6 or less rolls, there's a couple ways I could do it. One way I could do it is I could go and do a count if and do less than seven. Or, since I happen to know there's 35 rolls here, <clears throat> I can just take the difference between 22 and 35. So I'm going to do that one. I'm going to do equals 35 minus that sum. Either way is going to give you, should give you the same answer because all the rolls are between 2 and 12. There's only 35 sets of dice rolls. So you can count up, since you already counted up the 7 and greater than 6, which is 7 through 12, if you count up the less than 7s, it will give you 13. Or if you just subtract your greater than sixes from 35, it's still going to give you 13. <coughs> so either way, you're going to get the same thing. So equals 35 minus 
22 is the number of good rolls. So we want to know 22 is what percent of the 35 rolls?
So just point at the cell instead of trying to read the calculator. I still can't get the zoomer back, the regular. Yeah. So click in the 42, count it. Click in the 42, then do count it. Yes. Now, the good news is, since I did all this here, all I have to do is copy and paste it into the other column. <clears throat> so what this effectively did is it turned an entire column of data into counted up by category. So, if you're doing course grades, you can do count ifs to get your A's, your B's, your C's, your D's, your F's. If you're doing, um, if you're doing boys and girls in classrooms, you can count up how many boys, how many girls. If you're, if you're trying to look at good grades versus bad grades, you just decide what makes a good grade. And you can do your count if and do greater than whatever, and they'll count. Do you have a question, Kelly? I think so. If you're looking at the percentage of boys versus girls in achievement level, you then run two separate high score analysis to see if there's a difference with boys and a difference with boys and girls, correct? Um, so you want to compare the boys to the girls or? Because when would you compare boys and girls? You compare the achievement of boys or the effect versus the achievement of girls. So, there's, so there's, good, there's a couple of possible reasons. One would be, so you've got one school and another school, right? And you want to see if there's a difference in the makeup of the, of the schools. Okay. So you do percent boys, percent girls for school A, percent boys, percent girls school B. Or you might want to see are the boys doing better than the girls, or vice versa. And then you would do boys percent passing, boys percent failing, girls percent passing, girls percent failing. In two separate analyses. No, you do it as one because you have pass as a row, fail as a row. Right. And then you have boys as a column, girls as a column. Which one is the expected, which one is the observed? Doesn't, doesn't matter, matter as long as as long as neither of them has a zero, it doesn't matter. Okay. And, and if one of them has a zero, then don't make that expected.
those of you who have like five questions on an idea on your survey, what you would do is you do count if for each question. And then while it's still raw, add it together. So if if this question and this question were dealing with the same idea, what I would do is I would add the number bit. And the number bad. And then I would convert it into a percent. You can't, or you can't add the percents. You have to add the raw numbers, then convert to the percent. So if you're combining questions together to get your category, well, your concept, your construct, add the raw numbers, then convert to the percent. Don't. Don't try to add the percent. Could you do the same thing with this, with ethnicity instead of boys, girls? Could you do ethnicity and have multiple expected and observed? Um, chi squared only compares two columns at any time. But if you want to do ethnicity in school A versus ethnicity in school B, you can have the two columns, school A, school B, and the six rows for the six different ethnicities. So you have how many Indians in school A, how many Indians in school B, how many Hispanic kids in school A, how many Hispanic kids in school B, how many white kids in school A, how many white kids in school B, how many black kids in school A, how many black kids in school B. Either one could be the expected and the observed, as long as the expected doesn't have a zero. That's correct. Okay. Because the folks who started using chi-square, they, they did the front-end calculation to calculate and expect it. We're using it really to compare two groups. Most of the time. This, this one in math class. So from here, if I were to do, if I wanted to do a kind of square, what I could do is, since both of these columns have the same number, I could take the raw numbers, do a copy, Come back over here and do a paste special where I'm just pasting values. Let me make that big so you can see it. So when I'm comparing my roles to whoever else's roles I was using, I had 22 good roles, 13 bad roles. They had 19 good, 16 bad. While I run chi square, and see as soon as I pasted it in. The reason I paste special is I told it ju uh, just paste the values, don't paste the formula. Because back over here on the sheet, remember this one's got a formula in, and it would, Excel wouldn't know what to do with that. So I, I copied it. When I came here, I said paste special values. As soon as I pasted it, so I went back and recalculated my chi statistic. So while I compare these two, my chi statistic is 1.101. Compared to the chi critical of 3.841, my chi statistic is less than, than my chi critical with an alpha of 0 0.05 at one degree of freedom of 3.841. Therefore, there is no significant difference between the two groups. And I know those of 
you who love the English language are going to hate this, but just keep repeating that sentence in chapter 4. You don't have to make it poetic. You just make it factual and technical. So you're, you're really going to have, if you're doing a bunch of chi-squares, you're going to have two sentences. Chi-statistic is less than. Chi-statistic is greater than. So basically, I just ran a chi-square on those dice rolls. The steps I did is first, I counted up how many data points were in each of the two categories. My two categories were good rolls, which were seven or above, bad rolls, which were six or below. I did that for my two groups of data because the two groups of data were the same size. They both had 35. I could take and paste the raw numbers into my chi-square spreadsheet and calculate it out for me. If one group had more than the other group, the two classrooms, one classroom had 28 kids, the other classroom had 30 kids, before I copied and pasted, I would turn the raw numbers into percents, making sure they total up to 100, both columns. I would paste the percents in, and remember, 1.0101. Actually, I'll just paste it. I'll just paste it. <coughs> look a little different, don't they? But the answer is the same. Not significantly different. If, if the groups are the same size, if they're not the same size, do percent. If you're comparing against theoretical, do percent. So when you go home, if you want to, you, uh, you can go ahead and split some of your data in in categories, good scores, bad scores, good GPAs, bad GPAs. Good attendance, bad attendance, if you've got attendance per kid. And then, after you've counted up goods versus bads, or yeses versus noes, or uses computers or doesn't use computers, whatever your two categories are, or if you've got three categories you're interested in, you throw that into your chi-square formula, and it'll spit out a chi-statistic. And when it spits out the chi-statistic, that will tell you whether or not there's a significant difference in the distribution between treatment and control, or your school and their school. So can you guess what your homework's going to be? <laughs> So your homework, describe the source of your data. What is it? Is it suspension? Is it grades? Is it attendance? Is it the, uh, how many times the kid goes to the bathroom? Give some specific details, who, what, when, that kind of stuff. Run a chi-square between your treatment and control groups, if appropriate, and explain the results. If you do not have, <coughs> if you do not have data of your own, 
take that spreadsheet that you used last time, convert the dice rolls into good or bad, and do a chi square between two of those columns. You're going to notice this is, the, this is going to be a recurring theme because when you're writing chapter four and chapter three, you're going to explain the specifics of the data, of the data how it was derived, what it means, all that stuff. Then you're going to run the analysis, then you're going to explain. Okay. Words to use while doing this. Significant or not. Population. Remember, whatever data you have, it's really just a sample of what might be a bigger population. So what you're really trying to find out, do you have two samples from the same population, or do you have a sample from one population and a sample from another population? The difference, what makes them a different population is if the distribution of those is narrower than the difference between them that would lead you to believe there are a different population on that specific trait. Okay. So, so like we said way back at the start, is if, if the distribution <coughs> is narrower than the difference between them, that would lead you to believe there are different populations based on that one trait. So if it's an attitude survey, it's based on attitude. If it's academic achievement in reading, it's different populations based on reading performance. Remember, no hypothesis. We're going to stop using no hypothesis after this assignment. Be remiss if you didn't ever have to say it, but by the time you turn in this assignment, you will have you said it enough. The null hypothesis is always there is no difference. The alternative hypothesis is there is a difference. <coughs> so if, if when you run the statistic, it's significant, then you throw out the null hypothesis and you go with the alternative, there is a difference. And they come from different populations. Deep breath. I'll let like this rattle around for a little bit because you know this is way new territory for everybody. We still use an alpha of 0.05? Yes. Alpha is still 0.05, and once again, the reason alpha is 0 0.05 is because everybody uses it, so nobody asks you why you chose it. Okay. What's really funny is when states do things with their accountability system, they have to explain to the federal government why it makes sense. And so when you read that garbage, it's hilarious because they start saying things like, well, due to the importance of this measure, we're going to use an alpha of 0 0.01. So it's important, so that's why it's a 0, 0.1 instead of a 0, 0.5. Well, this is really important, so you have to include 50 students before you make a decision. There was actually one state tried to convince the feds that their subgroup size should be 2% of the school population. So if you don't have, you know, is if you don't have as many UC kids as 2% of your school population, they just don't count. That one day won't. But when, when you start getting into changing your alphas, you're just waving your hands and might as well just go with Okay, other questions you have? 
I do want you to paste into your assignment the chi-square table. Remember, APA, you number tables and you name them. Name them something that keeps your reader from having to ask what this is. <coughs> One of the few positive things I learned working for DPI is my boss always told me, when you do a graphic or a table, if somebody has to ask you what it is, you did it wrong. If your committee has to ask you what the table is, you did it wrong. Name it better. Other questions? Bunch of you have questions for me for, for after class. However, if you need more detail about what we went over today, this is in Pagano 9, 11, 16, and 17. Once again, the assignment is due at 12 or 1 a.m. next time we have class. Um, for next time, read Pagano 18. Go back over Crestwell 7 and 8, there's the two of them, it's, it's the same stuff. Um, and put the wrong slide up here, no, we don't be February 4th. It's the other folks who, who get to spend that on time to be aware of Any other questions for the